Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life through inspirational, motivational, and educational content. Today, we are focusing all about the mind, and we'll be talking a lot about the unseen illnesses and particularly focusing on Tourette's. My guest today has literally been through hell and back. Like myself, she's lived enough for at least two lifetimes. She has given talks all over the United States and is one of the most gifted natural speakers that I have ever, ever come across. She has been a Tourette's sufferer, a Tourette's fighter, and amazingly, a Tourette's conqueror. Please welcome the one and only, the always lovely and energetic, Amanda Bossy. Amanda, welcome to the show, my dear. How are you doing today? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me. It is an absolute pleasure. It really, really is. I'm delighted and excited to uh, to do this show with you. And I, again, we're going to unpack such an amazing story here. Um, and yeah, I, I can't wait. I really can't. Amanda, for the people at home that maybe haven't encountered you, share with us a little bit about yourself and, and who you are. Well, so my name's Amanda, obviously, and I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. And so since I was little, I always felt called to change lives, to grow and and do something meaningful with my life. And uh, so I really was passionate about, you know, mental health and uh, growing up, I went through a lot of severity with Tourette syndrome and other areas. And from there, I decided to go into college with a degree in uh, human services and um, psychology and, and things just, just to really grow in my, in my passions and interests. And uh, from there decided to really work on ways to better improve lives of others. So um, thanks to all of my experiences, which I will share on eventually, um, that's where I'm at today. That is really incredible. I mean, it really is. Uh, it, it's an amazing journey that you've been on. And I cannot wait to unpack it with you guys uh, today because it, it's one of these rare inspirational stories of someone that's not only had this life limiting illness, but also come out the other side. And again, we're going to unpack this a lot. Amanda, what was early life like for you growing up and into your teenage years? Oh man, well before, before yes. Tourette's, oh wow, well, let's see, growing up, um, I was very different, I will just say it straight up, I was definitely a different kind of soul, um, I have two older siblings, and I was nothing like my family, so growing up, going to school, um, being at home, I was very to myself, And it was very challenging to, you know, make friends and just be open and expressive of who I am and what I'm about. And um, it just kind of took off from there, probably within the mental health areas. Um, And it's just been, it's everything that has happened, everything that I have felt being different, that was a gift to be who I am right now. So really to dive into thinking about all the craziness and the weird quirks that I was doing and feeling since being like five years old. um, I'm like, okay, yes, that makes sense. Now I don't feel so weird. Right. And, and I feel like I'm that person that even my family comes to for help and support because 
I'm just that oddball. And if you're an oddball out there, hey, it's that's okay. You it, have a purpose. It you're is absolutely. Something. And I think that's incredible because, you know, that is how I define so much of my own life uh, for so long. It's just, you know, I saw the world in a very, very different way um, than other people. And, uh, you know, I had other things like dyspraxia and, and other things that came along. So you see things completely different to like what you say other people do. But in that, you know, there is an amazing, amazing gift, as we're going to touch on uh, momentarily. And, uh, you know, again, I want to echo what Amanda said, that anybody who's going through these struggles and thinking to themselves, I just don't fit in, I'm really different. Hey, you know, you're talking to two people and listening to people right now that went through their entire life doing that. And we have gone on, obviously, to have a very unique and very, very blessed and privileged life as a result of, you know, other things. And I always say, you know, when you see like Tony Stark or Captain America or any of these other guys, people say, oh, wow, it must be amazing to be them, forgetting that these guys have got life limiting <laughs> illnesses and conditions and all this other stuff. They can just be superheroes when they need to be. And that's a lot of the time what we go through. Um, Amanda, I wanted to ask you, because obviously we're talking about Tourette's today. What were some of the mm -hmm. first signs um, for you in, in, when, when you started to find out that maybe things weren't quite right oh man this is definitely within fifth grade which right. i'm trying to think back to the age probably around 10 years okay. old was when uh, my parents kind of looked at each other and thought well something's a little off about her <laughs> and i started to have ocd behaviors okay. so obviously Tourette's is just one peak of the yeah. iceberg but there's a bunch of stuff going on so um I started to have OCD behaviors and I had to erase things rewrite them again um I would count certain things for no reason you know don't step on a crack right you're break your mama's back like all those like little things <laughs> that your, your mind is just like literally caught on and I just felt so strange like mm -hmm. why am I doing these things and that was the, around the time that I was actually misdiagnosed okay. for having ADD when it was OCD. Uh -huh. And then they put me on medication at the age. That was the, the very beginning. And then it kind of took off from there. Because from my understanding with ADD and OCD, I mean, literally the polar opposites. You know, one is literally where you can't concentrate at all. The other one is where you concentrate on it and absorbing so much that it has to be exactly so. Um, and, you know, it, it's like the whole thing, if someone takes a square, for example, and they turn it sideways, or if it's not quite central, you know, it can drive people absolutely insane. And, and you know, some people that don't have it will never get and understand this. And this is why we're having this conversation tonight. And we have these conversations with mind, body and soul, because we want you to be able to understand from someone else's perspective, some, someone else's mindset as well of what's going on. Um, Amanda, you you very eloquently described some of the effects uh, of uh, of Tourette's that were, were coming along and the fact that you were misdiagnosed numerous times by doctors and I again I've watched your your, your interviews and your um, your uh, your, your uh, public speaking and things and you know uh, yeah I know what it's like to be misdiagnosed by the doctor so I can imagine for you know a 10 year old it's going to be really frustrating and and just to kind of throw something out there people may be asking you know why would what why all of a sudden now would it happen Studies have shown that our DNA re, re, try again, rewrites itself every several years, around several years. It can be a little bit over, a little bit less. Sometimes we get things in life, certain allergies, and it can just be mild things, certain allergies. It can be certain conditions. It can be certain uh, quirks, as, as Amanda said. I, I like the word quirks. It's, it's a great word. Um, or idiosyncrasies, uh, to, to use a, a bigger word. No idea what it means, but it sounds good. Um, but the whole thing about it is sometimes because of our DNA rewrites and our DNA changes, that can set off a trigger of a reaction where we didn't have it before, in case you're wondering, obviously, how this all came about. Amanda, talk us through, because I, I still, you know, I, I shake my head uh, at this, and sometimes with the medical system, how, in some ways, the doctors could have got it so wrong. And I, I suppose they were looking for something else, uh, that they're not thinking these things. Walk us through some of the things that were going on when you were being diagnosed with, uh, with, with your gift or Tourette's or issue or whatever you want to call it. Like around the time that I was diagnosed, 
and like what kind of some things were going on? Well, so being misdiagnosed um, when I was younger, that really set it off to realizing that, I mean, at the time, I didn't know that maybe OCD was a thing. So I was like, okay, I have ADD. But, um, but then, you know, growing up and being in middle school, it was that, that area when the weird behaviors okay. started to transform into full-blown tics, okay. as, you know, we call these urges yeah. that um, people with Tourette's have. And the OCD that I was encountering, what would happen was that formulated into the urge to do okay. something such as I have to hit my hand on the table, but now I have to hit my hand three times mm -hmm. to feel accurate enough to shake hands with my brain and say, it's okay, mm -hmm. but I'm in pain. Right. So when that became uh, consistent, in seventh grade, I started the urge to bite my tongue. Okay. And that was when my family was like, something's really traumatizing yeah. and wrong right now. So that was when I was then diagnosed and they had to take me into, you know, certain areas to get treated and checked up and blood work. And, yeah. um, and that's, that's when they, they thought, okay, this is what's going on. And Tourette's is a okay. part of your daughter's life. Okay. I want to ask you as well, Amanda, uh, one of the things that came into my head as you were talking there that was jotting down, did you ever notice that you can remember um, a trigger? Like oftentimes, you know, sometimes things will trigger a reaction and stuff. Was there anything that you noticed before you started having the, the episodes? Wow, that's a great question. Because I love the, I try. Deep, <laughs> the deep thoughts. Yes, it's, it's so important. And I love asking people today that I talked with about that. Um, you know, I don't recall anything specific that was the trigger. I just remember having countless of, um, you know, things would come up day to day. Every day was different for me. And whether I was at school or at home, it's almost as if the, the area that I was in, the setting, the noise, the feeling, okay. you know, and being so sensitive to energies today in which I didn't know that was a thing growing up, yeah, but um, yeah. And I feel like it just kind of took effect into multiple areas. Yeah. Um, and which today I look back and see the, the synchronicities yeah. and the connection to that, but I don't think there was one particular okay. thing. Okay, because and the, the reason I ask is because I'm reading a, a fantastic book at the moment. It's all about the mind, and it's by a world-renowned uh, brain guy. Um, and basically, he's talking about memory in particular and the fact that we, we don't see things almost like a, a video recording. We see things as photographs with different sights, smells, thoughts, all that stuff. And that's how our memories are built up. Um, stuff which I found absolutely fa fascinating, and we're going to be delivering further teaching on uh, about this. But it was, you know... it. it it explains so many of those things to me that, you know, there's certain actions that we can do, like Amanda was saying, where she's tapping a hand three times for the brain finally to register, oh, that need is met. And then now I can move on and I can do other things. Um, Amanda, we talk about, uh, or certainly you've spoken about the amount of times that you were both misdiagnosed, but what I want to really touch on was the amount of pills that you were on. Talk to the folks uh, that are watching this about the medication you were prescribed. Oh man, oh, going back to the medication, I'm so grateful that I am away from that yeah. that time frame. Um, yeah, they placed me on, so in fifth grade, they started me out. I don't remember the name of the medication, but it hurt my stomach so bad. Right. So right when I started to have a lot of serious effects from Tourette syndrome, that's when they started placing me on antipsychotic prescriptions. Okay. And these prescriptions were, there was about four or five at a time. And they were also uh, given to me with other anti-seizure 
medication. So now they just kind of were throwing me stuff as a guinea pig, um, certain things for my, my body, my mindset. And now they really didn't know what they were giving me to yeah. the point where they even gave me the nicotine patch and I never wow. smoked in my life. <laughs> so exactly. So, um, when I was in high school, you know, it became a very severe case to the point that I couldn't function right. every day, every second of, um, of the day. Imagine your mind is saying, I want you to hurt yourself, mm -hmm. you know, punch yourself in the face, box your ear, bite your tongue. Like there's, it's constantly going and going and you can't shut it off. So which wound me up in a psychiatric ward. Uh -huh. And they gave me even more medication and their whole method was to make sure that I just slept like a zombie yeah. just to heal my wounds because I wasn't able to. And, um, and I was on the nicotine, didn't nicotine patch, like I said, so I was walking into high school with that looking crazy and everyone's like super confused why I'm on that. And, uh, and even when my parents would go to try and talk with them and say, okay, Amanda had not so much of a great day in school, they knew it was a problem when the, the medical field, they, they would talk with my parents and, and let them know, hey, if she had a bad day, just give her one of these, you know, um, a clonidine, a, a Ritalin or whatever. And they would just tell them, just throw little pieces together and that's when my parents looked at each other and thought, okay, this isn't right because yeah. we're not the doctors here. So they just drugged me up wow. that I was just in a walking coma. And again, you, you know, you, you're going through this and I need to emphasize this to people just, just to make sure they're aware. You're going through this as a high school teenage girl. Your body's going through a number of changes as it is, you know, and, you know, what we always laugh as adults, you know, that your body's going through some insane amount of changes every single minute, pretty much, and your brain's firing off on all different cylinders, and you wonder why teenagers are always tired. Well, this is the reason. Um, you know, I, I mean, this is a whole nother topic, you know, to, to, to discuss, because I know, um, just, just to give you a little bit of background for myself, I was misdiagnosed as a colitis sufferer, and a colitis is something that affects the small intestine, into the colon, and, and so on, so, so on. I've had it since I was 15 years old, and I was misdiagnosed for a decade. I was basically put on a medication for a decade that I'm highly allergic to, and I spent most of my early 20s and, and you know, probably late teens, early 20s, just zoned out into another world. But because at that point we didn't know, hey, you should question the doctors, um, you know, it, it was it was never even thought of that a doctor could misdiagnose or something was going on. Obviously, now that this is coming out more and more, um, you know, but but it had massive effects on me. And I'm really glad that Amanda shared that because we're going to talk about some of the side effects momentarily. But when people are misdiagnosed and they're given a drug or a pill or, or, or a, an injection or whatever it might be, it is changing your chemical balance. It's changing the way that your brain is firing off on all different cylinders. So don't be surprised. And I ask people all the time, hey, if you are diagnosed with colitis in one case and you are prescribed this medication, can you tell me? you know, what kind of side effects you have. We're doing a lot of research behind the scenes. It's all good fun. Um, but Amanda, I want you to talk to us a little bit actually about some of the side effects that the pills had for you. Do you struggle with motivation? Feel yourself procrastinating a lot? Have amazing ideas and dreams, but struggle with the concepts of how to get from where you are to where you want to be? Or maybe looking for something a little bit simpler, like wanting to get fit or maybe wanting to lose a few pounds and tighten things up? Are you someone that struggles with anxiety or trauma or even depression? You're not alone. Many people around the world do. Hi folks, I'm John Morris. And for the last two decades, I've been working with people from all over the world in all walks of life to really understand human beings, the concept, the behaviors, and ultimately the reasons why. And I've had the privilege of coaching and working with folks just like you that maybe you're struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma or wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe build some long-term success, but have no idea how to begin. This is what I do. And with John Morris Life Coaching, you're in really, really good hands. Why can I say this? 
because you're not only going to get an experienced life coach, you're also going to get somebody that has a wide variety of experiences from youth ministry and working with teenagers and children to someone who's worked with drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have day-to-day -day dependency issues, to, to somebody maybe just like you that just wants that little bit of encouragement, wants that little bit of motivation and wants support to get to that next level. With John Morris Personal Life Coaching, you're in really good hands. A lot of my clients would tell you if they were here now that one of the greatest assets to John Morris Life Coaching is you can see things exactly as you want to see them without fear of being controlled and conformed like a lot of therapists and coaches do. We help you right where you're at to get to the place that you want to be, step by step, to figure out a plan. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in, having that support, motivation, encouragement, and even education, should you need it, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. Places are limited, so please don't delay. We've got a very, very small window of opportunity remaining. We all need help from time to time, but the difference between success and failure, achieving our dreams, and maybe just letting our dreams go by, depends on the level of help that we have available and that we're willing to accept. So get in touch with me today at John Morris Life Coaching. You'll be glad you did, and I'll see you soon. There is a lot of we side We could be effects. here a while. <laughs> yeah, we could be here all night and all day here. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I also forgot they, they even um, had injections in my backside um, wow. that my dad had to give me. Oh my so goodness. talk about an embarrassing moment yeah. when you come home from school and it's like, okay, it's that time, right? And I'd be like, dad, I'm all right. I've learned how to do it myself. Like, like, yeah, right. But it, you know, it was like, it was awkward. Yeah. And, and yeah, as a teen, you're so impressionable at that age. You, you want to fit in. You really want to yeah. like, absolutely. You're trying to make friends and like, you can't even live with yourself and it, and you just want to sleep all the time. Yeah. So there's nothing getting done. Um, so yeah, as far as the side effects, I slept most of the day, even, um, when I was in school, when I came home, my teachers would t send my family an email saying, Hey, she's sleeping in classes. Wow. And they would email them back and say, you know, if you were taking the medication she yeah. is, you would be asleep too. And it's not that she comes home and, and like life is good. She's yeah. in her bed right now. Yeah. And um, so that was challenging. And then I would have gaining weight. Um, there was a oh. few medications that really made me hungry all mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. Like I could, I would bring stuff in my backpack just to like shove in my face because like I was just always like yeah. in that mood to eat and yeah. and i guess that's that's cool but you know again it wasn't benefiting me and uh yeah believe it or not so i gained like 30 something pounds yeah um and then um you know my overall fatigue energy was mm -hmm. off um there's so many there's yeah. so many yeah. uh memory uh couldn't really recall things and then um that was mm -hmm. i'm sure we're going to talk more about this but Absolutely. that was why fundamentally why i decided to stop my medication yeah, yeah. because you know and again I, I need to emphasize a point that i don't think we've actually touched on amanda was over 50 plus medications and different pills and all sorts of different things this was not just one or two different things so imagine you know taking one pill and it having side effects then imagine taking another 49 and all the different side effects that come with this. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we talk about a lot is, is the, the fact that people and physicians now are starting to learn how to deal with the core issues rather than the symptoms. Obviously at this time, they're not doing that. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that there was so much that was going on there. Um, you know, what, I, I do want to, to talk a little bit just before we move on about some of the uh, misconceptions because I know when originally you and I uh, started talking about Tourette's um, one of the things because I'd asked a couple of people you know if, if they had questions and things and one of the misconceptions was that Tourette's is basically where you stand up and you can't stop swearing you know it, it's f this and f that and I'm and I'm like I need to do some more research here because I don't think that's just it you know there's a lot more obviously that goes into it like you described 
if you can go, you know, a little bit deeper, obviously you talked about biting your tongue and punching your ear. Were there other um, side effects or even misconceptions that you'd come across when you were diagnosed with Tourette's? Oh, it was a lot of learning for me too in the beginning after diagnosis. Um, yeah, swearing is definitely thanks to social media. Um, and I think today we're doing a good job at really emphasizing the understanding of Tourette's. Yeah. There's a lot of words, a lot of scientific words that describe different things. Like there's one for cursing, there's one for repeating people's mm -hmm. words. Um, and then there's others where you're just, you know, doing a lot of motor movements and then vocalizations. Um, so in the beginning, um, I'm trying to think back to anything specific regarding uh, the misconceptions. Obviously, uh, swearing was one of them. And uh, until they realized that there's a lot of pain and movements yeah. associated with it. And what is what somebody is going through on one case yeah. like blinking or twitching there's a whole another thing going on and it's someone else okay. and it can shift all the time so somebody might have blinking tomorrow but then next week they might be having a, a full-on attack yeah. with something else of course uh, and i was just going to say you know that the um that the whole thing and I, and I love what you said about social media there that it's giving people the opportunity now to really have a voice because for, for a long time, this, this whole thing about hidden illnesses, and I do want to talk about this obviously with you because I guarantee at some point you've had people say, well, if I can't see it, it, it ain't there. Um, yeah. You know, I have that for, for, a number of for a number of years with a medical misdiagnosis, with colitis, or oh, if we can't see it, it can't exist. Um, and obviously now people are starting to look more on the inside and saying, well, hang on a second. It's not just what I see here. It's also what's, you know, going on around me. What were, you know, again, you, you've got friends, you've got family, you've got extended relatives, neighbors. Um, were the people that came up and said, you know, ah, she'll, she'll either grow out of it or, you know, that, that weren't maybe as supportive as, as they could have been just because they didn't understand it because it's one of these hidden illnesses. Oh, who were those people? Ooh, um, definitely people in school. Right. Definitely people in school, um, as well as teachers. Mm -hmm. And when I think back, you know, people ask me, you know, oh, high school days, you know, I, I'm sorry, I despised high school with a passion. And in fact, driving, talk about trauma, yeah. right? Spiritual trauma. When I drive past a high school, any, I'm like, oh, yeah. right. It literally affected me to the point that I can't even look at it the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, those that I help today are in high school. Yeah. So that's why I have that passion for them. And yeah, so definitely the kids around, they can be very cruel, you know, that, and they're not understanding what's happening. And you're going to experience that as well as the teachers. I was told certain things. Um, and even growing up and having dealt with so much and coming out of it the way I have, I'll still have people that yeah. say, oh, you probably had a really mild case then. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I take it in and I'm like, well, they, you know, obviously you don't see anything right now. Yeah. Um, and then recently had somebody who um, didn't think that I had Tourette's at all Wow. to the point that they were trying to kind of share different things about my my brand my name that were yeah. wrong and uh luckily i have a very powerful support group mm -hmm. and people that believe in what i'm doing and those i've helped thus far and so it's been really changing the legacy of mm -hmm. mental health it's okay. bringing the spiritual awareness to mental health and coming out of it yeah. not just getting stuck in the same cycle I, I think it's, it's really fantastic what, what you brought up there about spiritual awareness, uh, because a couple of our guests that we've had on previously, you know, we talk about different things. And one of the things it's, it's like a it's like a theme that seems to come up, a common thread is that, you know, when people are ill, for whatever reason, a lot of time people don't know what to do or what to see. So, you know, again, if the spiritual and if the church folks sometimes 
Uh, they'll, they'll do so many things and they're like, I want to pray for you. I want to lay hands on you. It's a spiritual attack. It's a spiritual war. And they give you all of this stuff and they want to give you every scripture under the sun. And as, as well-meaning as it might be, is not actually helping the fact, folks, you know, because you're not listening to what the person is actually saying, like what Amanda's been saying. She's like, and, and we're going to unpack this in a second. If you understood what an average day for Amanda was like, um, and I know it's kind of a hard question to ask because of what she just told me that, you know, one minute she can have the twitching, next minute she can be punching her ear, next minute she's biting her tongue, you know, and, and someone wants to come and lay hands on you at this point, like, how is this even helping me? You know, it may be helping you, but right. it's helping me. The best thing that we can do in these situations is to listen to the person. Amanda, as, as best as you can, um, walk us through what an average day in your life was like um, when you were at high school and all these things are going on. Oh, this is going to be exciting <laughs> <laughs> because I'm trying to write this part of my story down. So let's see. Um, it, it was, okay, imagine you're 16 years old. And, you know, there's probably people listening who are that age right now. And my typical start of the day was immediately, like, again, I slept to keep sane. I love sleeping. So when I knew, okay, my alarm goes off, I have to wake up. My mind is already ready to go and not ready to go as, oh, what a great day it is. It's, it's now like, oh, we're awake box your ear, bite your, you know, and it just goes, it goes and goes and goes. So to give you even an idea, it's as if I asked everyone to stop blinking. And the more you're thinking about, okay, I'm not going to blink. I'm not going to blink. The more the urge becomes stronger. Now imagine the form of blinking to being the most indescribable pain that you can think of the the most pain my brain was locking onto the pain my Tourette's was pain induced which meant that anybody who's doing this like or twitching that's great but for me my brain needed to feel pain to stop that tick so when I would wake up in the morning my brain was already alarmed and and so a part of me is scared and anxious because I don't want to cause pain yeah. to myself. And then my other part of my brain is like, no, we need this. I, I need to do this now. Mm-hmm. Like, and then the more you hold mm-hmm. off, the worse it becomes because it's more challenging, more challenging. So to just, just wake up, you, up, you know, <laughs> what's that? This is just when you wake up first thing in yes. the morning. This isn't, you know, yes. I've gone to school, I'm doing all this. It's when she just woke it up. Sorry, Amanda, uh, continue. No, you're fine. It, and that's the thing. It's like when you have a lot of stuff to do in the day, you know, when you wake yourself up and you're like, your heart's already racing, like, oh my God, I got so much stuff going on. That's the feeling. But for me, it's like my, my, my pain, that scratch on my face is finally healing. Can I let, can I just leave it be, mm-hmm. right? Can I just like let it alone? And my brain wants to go after it. And that was a point when I was dealing with hormones, cool. right? As a teen, you're going through all these phases. And then all of a sudden, if that's not enough, my parents come in, hey, it's time to get up. And it's like, no, yeah. can I like stay home today? Um, and so trying to get myself out of bed, um, I would, so getting ready for the day, typically in a person takes like what, like an hour, you shower, you get ready. For me, I couldn't even like do the simplest of tasks because I was trying to like do all these OCD behaviors and try to work with my brain, even though I had to tick all the time. Yeah. And so at that point, I just stopped caring as much and just try to throw on stuff just so I could like get my body ready for the next attack that my brain wanted on me. So, um, it became that that rhythm and then going downstairs my dad always made me this big meal because i was always hungry <laughs> and and i like i felt like a pig every morning cuz i was just always just dying to eat food so it started with that and then taking my medication um being driven to the bus stop mm-hmm. and see it's it's not every certain moment of the day yeah. it is every minute 
Wow. If you can even imagine every minute of every day, your mind, you're trying to fight with it. Mm -hmm. It's like having this little kid like tugging at you all the time. And I am constantly thinking about things. How is the day going to go? Am I going to get picked on? Am I going to get made fun of? Is my teachers going to like smack my desk with a book because I fell asleep, which they did do. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I can't wait to get home. Why? Because I can go to bed yeah. and then it starts again. Um, now the whole entire day, that was just a living nightmare wow. um, because you're trying to sit still in class. Your mind's going 20 miles an hour, a lot more than that. You know, it's wanting to do all kinds of things. You got people looking at you like, well, why is there a mark on our face yeah. today? Yesterday was something else, right? So now I'm dealing with the anxiety wow. of that with my teachers like, hey, bossy, which is my last name, obviously, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Amanda, like, hey, pay attention. And now I'm stuck in like ADD. My mind's wow. over here. My ticks are over here. I got people looking at me. Oh, now I have an exam to do. Oh, I have five minutes left. I didn't get through five questions. Wow. So this is, I mean, I'm glad that you're taking yeah, in yeah. what I'm saying, and yeah. I'm sure a lot of the listeners will too. And that, that's why I asked, because I think it's really important yeah. for people to know these things. Yeah. And I'm sure like it, Tourette's is just one part of it. Mm -hmm. I know there's so many kids right now that are struggling with so many different things, yeah. you know, emotional wounds, physical wounds on other areas. And um, you know, just the abuse of society and just how we're, uh, how we're looked at and we're trying to fit in. We're trying to just live our lives and we can't even do that. And so, you know, the rest of the day in school and classes is all the same, all the same. I would fall asleep in classes. I would be waking up three classes later. So I would be in a whole nother room of kids that I didn't know only to have another pass to get back to my other wow. class. Where were you? I fell asleep. Well, what happened? Well, my teachers left me in there. Great. And this is the first time I'm ever sharing this. And you know, this is, I'm sure so many are going to get a kick out of it. There'd be times I would try to help my teachers out by doing like extra coursework, mm -hmm. you know, like, what can I do to um, help so-and-so out just in a little time to to make up for what I missed when I would get that tired I would go to the bathroom I, I never said this to anybody I'm sure my parents are gonna be like what <laughs> you did that I did I would go to the bathroom and I would just just sit there like either on the ground or like not using the bathroom but just sit yep. somewhere and sleep I was literally just sit and sleep. And well, if I woke up another, like when the bell went off, I don't know what class it is. Not that it matters. Not like I got anything done. <laughs> oh, oh, it's time to go home already. Okay. So literally, you know, it, it would just became this, well, whatever type of ordeal just because I couldn't function. Wow. And, um, and not to mention, you know, I had surgery on my ear because I cauliflowered it from boxing it. I couldn't talk. I couldn't eat. I couldn't really function. So that's, um, let's see, that's right around the time when it got to the point that I had to go somewhere. Yeah. I had to be in a hospital because it was just too much. Yeah. And, and, and before we get there, I mean, I want to ask, you know, what was the support like from your family? I mean, that was incredible, certainly unpacking all those things. And, and thank you so much for sharing that, because that gives a real in-depth and insight into what's going on in one particular Tourette's uh, sufferer's story and what's going on in their lives. Amanda, sorry, what was uh, your support like from your family around this time? How did they really process and understand it? Well, it took some time. It definitely took some time for them to acknowledge the severity of it. Mm -hmm. So coprolalia is the cursing okay. that people have. And coprolalia first began in my symptoms. So um, I'd be at the table just saying the B word, a 
you know, a few times. And my sister would be like, dad, she called me the name again. And I'd be like, no, I didn't. What? No, no, not at all. And I'd be like, I said, which? And I had to have soap in my mouth. Wow. And this was before they knew mm -hmm. that Tourette's was even present, that it was even a thing. And so, you know, now I always joke with them, like they got to make up for that. But, you know, I went through so many different forms of that and they started to see, oh, wow, this is more intense. Oh, wow. She, you know, did that to her face again. Like it was always face oriented, mm -hmm. which is still pretty insane to think about because I broke my nose and my ear and my, oh. like, I, I, went through everything on my face, any form of anything that you see, it was a tick at one time. And so my family support, just them being there, just them having my back, God forbid anything came up or teachers being horrible to me. I knew that they always supported that. And they would just sit with me on the couch if I just was asleep or in pain. Um, I, my my after school was having ice packs. And like, you know, after medication, I just sit with ice packs all over my wow. all over my body, just from like the trauma of it. And um, and it took time for my my family to even see. Um, like there's certain things that really were testing mm -hmm. the patients yeah. and patients comes in handy a lot. And for my, both of my parents, it was hard, you know, they had their own stuff going on. And so I know my dad really had to challenge himself to not get mad when I would throw my own little tantrums when I would I would be so in pain because mm -hmm. my mind wanted that pain and while he's talking to me about why didn't you finish your work right why didn't yeah. uh, why did this come up like and then my my other siblings and Amanda you didn't put your dishes away or whatever I'm like in my mind like just this doesn't even matter right so they could see that it was every area that really played a factor. And when I wasn't feeling good inside, which is huge, spiritually speaking, yeah, yeah. when we're not connected and balanced energetically and physically, then the little things in the day are gonna bother us. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have our own little feelings about them. Absolutely. So of course, dishes don't matter to me. I'm in pain, yeah. right? I'm I'm suffering right now. so you know, just let me be kind of thing. And, um, you know, today they're still blown away They They've really had my back through all of the things that I've accomplished and, yeah. and I've succumbed to. I was going to ask you as well, and it just came into mind that was there a history of Tourette's within your family? No. Right. So, so you're, you're the first one. <laughs> I am the youngest and I managed through the most of challenges like every little thing that um was different i was the oddball so the spiritual gifts the sensitivities to literally everything food sound taste smell um and Tourette's mm -hmm. and other mental health areas i was i was the child that endured <laughs> all that Wow. And, um, and the one that's really creating something different mm -hmm. for this world because Absolutely. it's necessary. And now I know why I, uh, I chose that on my path. Like I literally believe I chose to come in with the severity of it, to have a story that people would listen to, yeah. to make breakthroughs, to make changes and to show how strong the soul is mm -hmm. when you sit and you want to figure it out, you can figure it out. Absolutely. When we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we find out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. 
live life long enough and you realise that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations to tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face, a devotional with a difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know that whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay. Order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself as long as you're drawing breath to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. But my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below and I'll see you on the other side. And, and like so. you said, I mean, the, the fact that you had, you know, family support that's there as well, it makes such a difference. I know I went through, uh, you know, things in my own life with misdiagnosis, of, as we mentioned, and my wife was like, because we were just newly married at that point. And she's like, what the heck have I married here? <laughs> you know? wow. um, because we didn't recognize a lot of these things. And rather than saying, I've got my bags, I'm off. She was like, we're going to the hospital and we're getting this stuff sorted out. Um, yeah. Talking of the hospital, obviously, um, one of your lowest points uh, to, to kind of set the stage was, you know, you, you bit your tongue to such a point that your dad, I believe, came in into the bathroom and was like, you know, we got to get you to the emergency room. We've we got to do something here to kind of set the scene here a little bit, folks. Um, in fact, no, I, I'll get to that in a second. Amanda, walk us through the series of events that happened when you ended up in, in hospital and ultimately that would end up in, in the psychiatric ward. Wow, so there was a lot of different things um, that came up. Um, I would say the the stress of school and all those things, that, like we talked about the atmosphere and, and the things that are going on with hormones, that was always manifesting something new for me. Okay. It was manifesting a whole nother urge, a whole nother set of ticks, a whole nother set of pain that I couldn't bear. Mm -hmm. So when my tongue started, that was seventh grade, middle school, and I was, again, going through the motions of what was happening and could not understand what it was. And I actually had an idea that Tourette's was a part of that, like you heard in my talk. I sat with myself and was like, okay, I need to know what is this? Mm -hmm. Like, if there is anybody listening, please send me a sign. And yeah. a week later, I hear somebody talking about it on the news or on TV. And I was like, that's it. And sure enough, um, yeah, the, the night that my tongue got so bad, my dad came in. Amanda, what are you doing? Like, stop. And I, I'm like, I can't. I literally, I can't. And I'm bleeding and I'm having a horrible time. And that's when they're like, okay, this is, 
this is serious. Yeah. So they took me to the ER and everyone was like, what is going on? Cause nobody has seen something mm -hmm. this traumatic before. And I recall my, my parents were so nervous that they were going to keep me overnight there. So I remember my dad was sitting with me and I just have this like stuff in my mouth. I don't even remember. It was like anything to get by. So I would take like a napkin, just shove it in my mouth, be like, I'm good. Even though I know I'm not, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to bake it till I make it. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and my dad's like, we'll have to like, you know, we'll, we'll get help, but let's make sure we we're able to just try to lie low. That way you don't have to stay overnight and cause they're not going to know what to do. And so that's when we just did a bunch of blood work up and they checked my parents too. And they, they really didn't know. And that's when somebody pulled my dad over and said, you know, this looks a lot like Tourette's. Right. And he said, just so you know, if this is what's going on, it's going to be a lot worse. Okay. And that was shocking. That was shocking for me to yeah, hear yeah. too. So this doctor tells my dad that, and my dad's like, what do you mean? Like, what is that? He said, you probably have seen so many different cases. Mm -hmm. And so he said, just know that's going to become a lot wow. progressive, a lot more progressive as she ages. Um, and just from my tongue, just from yeah. one thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so found out that's what it was. Okay, great. I have a label now in the yeah. physical world. You yeah. know how that goes. Okay, now what do I do? Oh, well, meds. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Did I run through um, the questions that you were curious on? Yeah. Because it kind of just, a lot of things led up to a lot of things. No, I, absolutely. No, absolutely. And, and literally, you know, thank God that that person was there to be able to say, you know, to your dad, to yourself, you know, I'm really thankful that, you know, um, you know, that someone was there and so as to say, look, that this got, this is going to get worse. This isn't just it. Um, you know, to, to kind of set the stage, I suppose, for your, for your next part, which was, you know, regarding um, the psychiatric ward, which, I mean, as, as a young girl, and we're talking, you know, you're 12, 13 years old here, you know, you, you're not, yeah. you know, in your 20s or 30s, it's never a good time at any point to, uh, to be told. And for anybody that's ever visited a psychiatric ward or has worked in a psychiatric ward, we had Gabe Nathan on right at the beginning of our podcast. He was working for suicide prevention. He worked in, in the psychiatric ward. And uh, my goodness, the stuff and the stories that he tells on there, he'll be on again, I'm sure, um, you know, is just, it's frightening. It, I mean, it really is, you know, that the way that you know, certain things go on, that certain things happen. But what makes it even worse is because at this point, Amanda is told, look, and, and she's going to set the stage for a little bit, tell the story. But one of the things that I latched on to was the fact that you were told as a 12 year old child, look, if you have a bad day with Tourette's, you ain't going to get to see your parents. What the heck does that do to somebody emotionally and mentally? I mean, and, and, and again, if it isn't too sensitive, because, you know, I, I mean, I blew up. I'll be honest when I heard that. I really did. I mean, my phone literally darted across the room because I was so cross. Um, but it, it was literally just like, oh, my goodness. Um, but what was it like for you? You know, it, it, I suppose in the lead up to going to the psychiatric ward, but also that first night when you're in there, you know, we, we, we call this, you know, almost like freeze frame because we like to pick a, a specific segment of a person's journey. And this one is just an incredible thing. The door closes or, or wherever you are and you're there, you know, and, and that's it. What, what was this part like for you? Scary. I can imagine. Very scary. And to back up a little bit, yeah. I explained in the TED talk I gave, um, the doctor that had saw me, mm -hmm. I was on the floor, just curled up, like right. a worried because your brain's going to create the next, yeah, next course. attack. And yeah. once you get rid of that urge, so to speak, it comes back five minutes later. It's just a matter of time. So at this point I'm like, well, okay, I'm in hurting. Now you have to wait for the next one. So when he kneeled down and said, do you, do you want to go to the hospital? Like, is this yeah. to the point, like you tell us. And I was like, yeah, 
because I knew at that point my parents couldn't do anything different and I always reassure them nothing they did could have you know they could have done anything different it was up to me to decide that for myself in my life and I needed something so that was when they signed me into the to the hospital psychiatric ward and the noise Mm -hmm. immediately the noise the there was this kid running and screaming in a whole nother direction and I remember my dad was like it's gonna be okay right so he's trying to like you know sugarcoat everything while I know he was trying to help himself what he was saying it's gonna be okay because my parents I mean imagine you're signing your child up and a big part of this is I was signed with the word of state which meant that my parents couldn't say anything that they did or how they treated me, I was under their care and they just had to like, let go and say, okay, well now we don't know what to do. Um, and so now, you know, it gets real. Right. So I remember they immediately put me in a room with somebody else and you have the little curtains in the middle. And then they realized that I was a mess. And my challenges were very different from so-and-so's, right? So that's when they put me in a whole nother room. And in this room, it was as much as you can, you know, imagine a cold room, nothing's going on. The smells of the the, the cleaning products and then you got noises and beepers and just everything seems out of control. And if that's not enough, you have your mind that you have to let that's the reason why you're in this place in the beginning in the first place so you know being in there they really had their own schedule of things Mm -hmm. so they definitely made sure to wake us up at a certain time and for me they they would wheel me around even in the evening if they needed my room for something they would I would wake up being rolled out into the hallway, into the hallway so that I was watched because I was watched all the time. So my case was different. So I needed somebody to literally take note of me when I showered, when I slept, when I ate, what I did, how I performed. And if I didn't perform well, they made sure so-and-so knew, which was the, the protocol, like of what they did next for me so I'm under this care yeah and also under a lot of anxiety Mm because I just wanted the heck out of there at this point and so um in in the night I would wake up to see this guy reading a book with the light shining in because oh he's taking notes of me it's important right Um, and then more medication, um, there are certain moments that we had to like do different things. We had groups and a few times in the day, if, um, if I needed to try and sit still, um, or let's just say I, I had to like touch my face a few times, Amanda, sit on your hands and be like, okay, all right. And I do that. And then the urge is still there because it's like, yo. I didn't get out what I needed to get mm-hmm. out, which makes the urge worse, yes. right? It's this like is where you have to understand. Threat. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, I need to blink, right? I need to do these things. So when I couldn't, they would be like, okay, Amanda, go go stand up the wall over there. Mm-hmm. And I'd have to look at a sign. They would like punish me yeah. for ticking, for for having mm-hmm. these, these behaviors that I didn't even want to mm-hmm. do in the beginning. So I guess it was a way to try to get my mind to understand the do's and don'ts. Yeah. But again, it's not just the mind. It's, it's, a, it's, all it's a disconnect. Yeah. It's a disconnect mentally. It's, yeah. it's your health. It's your mental health. And so I had to read the signs and uh, my, my friends would be like, well, why is she over there? Like reading the the warning labels of the fire hydrant or whatever because they would just make me stand next to it um and so like after I do that I'd sit back down 
So you can imagine your thoughts at this point. Okay, don't do that again. Now I'm embarrassed and I'm trying to impress here and trying to make wow. friends, even in the hospital. I don't want to be that person. Um, and then when I couldn't do that again, the padded room, they would put me in this padded room, which didn't do anything because I'm harming myself at this point. So, um, and then from there it led to other things where, um, okay, you had a bad day, you can't see your parents, which again was trying to train yeah. the mind, the do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have a bad day and you can't figure it out, we're going to remove something. Wow. But they're not understanding. I see yeah. what they were trying to do, mm -hmm. but what they were lacking is again, the impressionable feeling there. You're, you're still developing. Yeah. And it's not like you wanted to be in here in the beginning. You're trying to figure it out just like they are. So, um, and then uh, again, like waking up and having to be put on a little gurney thing and, and even put tying your hands to the bars to make sure wow. you're not going to tick so they can give you the, your shots and do what they need to do. Um, and then, okay, go to group and you have to sit in group while you want to fall asleep but I can't do that because then I can't see my parents and then this and then this and then this. And it's just, it's a process, which again is why I'm trying to write these things yeah. and talk about them. And it's very hard to do yeah. because it was so much going on. And then I would have like flowers taken away from me because they were in a, in a vase. And I understand, you know, the making sure I'm okay and not yeah. going to do something crazy. But, um, you know, I, at that point, tried to do everything I could just to get out yeah. at that point. Wow. And that is actually the power. Again, if we talk yeah. spiritual, if we yeah. talk about that particular mm -hmm. thing, I recall in the evenings, I would wake up and I remember just, I was already like in my own form of prayer. I was already like, okay, there's gotta be somebody here that's yeah. watching this. I don't like this. <laughs> What's going on, you know? And, um, and I remember that's when I started to pay attention. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have an idea cause I was still in and out of consciousness yeah, really with all the medications, but I knew that, okay, there's got to be something else more yeah. going on to this. And then I would do half school and half group mm -hmm. work and half hospital. So mm -hmm. they try to like balance that, which yeah. didn't really go that great. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, and then um, I was called into the office with my, my fam family. And um, the doctor said, you know, she had a great day. Okay. She can be sent home. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is a highlight. So I'm stoked. I thought I did a great job when really my health insurance couldn't cover me anymore. Wow. So oh my, my, my family made sure to keep that to themselves, but that's the reality. Wow. They couldn't handle keeping me in there because of the expense. Therefore, well, now we have to let her go. And she's still heavily medicated. And my family's like, oh, shoot. Now, how do we approach yeah. this? So in a way, I could have been in there a lot longer. Yeah. And also, when I think about it, that was the breakthrough to help get me out to figure it out for myself. Yeah. And I knew I was the best person to do that. Yeah. I was the absolute best person to do that. And I, that's where I think that's actually the, the blessing in yeah. disguise, why I'm able to function mm -hmm. how I am today. Because I found a way to work with the movements yeah. so they're not noticeable because I was already subconsciously in my, in my state of mind. If you take, you're going to go back there, yeah. right? So I started this process of, I'm going to work with it myself. Oh, I feel that tick coming on. Let me work with it. And I work with it and I work with it and it becomes easier and easier. Yeah. And I was, I always knew the worst case scenario would be having to go back to that yeah, and back to the same old lifestyle mm -hmm. every day in trauma mode. And that, that feeling was what my soul was like, heck yeah. no. 
right? Yeah. So I'm going to figure it out for myself and I can continue to talk so deep about this, but that's where my yeah. healing began. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that in itself is incredible. I mean, you know, to, to me living over here in the UK, um, you know, we had something similar in the 1800s. It's like Victorian therapy, what you've just described. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, oh my gosh, I mean, it's incredible, I think, in a lot of ways that you survive that. And genuinely, I, and I haven't said that to, to any other guest <laughs> that's been on, but you listen to that, folks, and, and, it, and it is, I mean, it's, it, 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 just incredible that you were able to survive that. Um, and, you know, w w when you were talking there specifically at the end, and you were saying, you know, that was the moment for you where, you know, you, you start to realize yourself that I, I've now got an association and we talk about associations a lot. And sometimes, you know, when people are getting out of debt, your association can be the bank. Well, you're going to do everything you can not to get back in debt. You know, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I don't end up homeless again. You were going to do everything that you were going to do to make sure you don't end up, you know, under Dr. Frankenstein's, uh, you know, uh, care and everything. Um, for you, so obviously you, you leave the, uh, the, 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 the ward and everything. Um, you pretty much had said, right, I'm done with medication now. And how did things really start to change for you? So, yeah, it was such a process. Mm -hmm. And when I was let go from there, it took some time. You know, I was still trying to figure out, oh, okay, school. Okay, yeah. what is that going to look like? Um, oh, I can sleep in. Oh, this is okay. Well, that's good. And so I had to work with the, the feeling mm -hmm. that I was already experiencing from that point, which is I'm a little achy. I'm not yeah. terrible, but I'm still dealing with the aftermath. Okay. And I was still taking the medication mm -hmm. throughout, mm, I would say a few months that kept going by mm -hmm. and going by. And I started to feel it out differently. And, um, but at this point I knew that my, my whole approach was there's the only way is up from yeah. here. Yeah. So that became different to work with that. And the pain that I had, or I shouldn't say pain, the, the effects of my body mm -hmm. that were left because of the, the problems, yeah. Um, my family and I tried to work a way to make sure that I could, you know, look somewhat normal again. Yeah. And, and because my brain was locked onto pain, if I healed that pain, my, my brain wouldn't be attached to it. If okay. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's like when sense. you have a cut and you want to keep yeah. messing with it. So, you know, I, I had to have surgery on my ear. They try to like get that sorted. Okay. My nose was deformed. I have a little deformity because of that. <laughs> Um, okay. So we got that checked and, um, they were like, we can't really do much cause she might mess it up again. Right. So we left that alone. Um, and my teeth, I didn't even go to that. Um, I had cavities all up here because wow. I had to grind my teeth to the point where there was nothing left. Wow. It was like nerve showing and it was so painful. I mean, it was like, I can't even describe the the uh, the feeling of it. It was so bad. So, just what we're talking short, about, Amanda. Sorry to cut you off. The, yeah, the reason that I no, wanted to just please. jump in there is because, um, you know, f to give people kind of an association for what Amanda's going through before she went into the psychiatric ward and started getting better, it would be like going twelve rounds with a world champion boxer. That's what they are likening it to when a teeth, uh, you know, having these issues, a face, a ear. Everything is there. Um, you know, this is kind of the level of effects and, and the exhaustion. So imagine going three minutes, you know, with a world champion. And a lot of you are like, oh, I couldn't even do that. You know, some of you may be like, oh, yeah, I could do that fine. But others, you know, think about going 12 rounds plus, you know, into extra time if you needed to with a world champion boxer. This is kind of what she's talking about on a, on a daily occurrence. So it's no wonder she's absolutely exhausted. Sorry, Amanda, continue. No, no, never apologize. This is like, I'm, I, I'm hoping that people really are like grasping the, the, the in-depth concepts of all this because, you know, it's, it is real and it's a challenge we face um, as humans, right, on this journey. So from there, I, I 
they try to work on my teeth mm -hmm. to get it somewhat back to a state of healing where the nerves weren't showing. So when I look back at pictures, when I was little, my nose was different. My smile was different. My whole demeanor was different. So I had to really accept the fact that, well, I will never look exactly the way I did before. And that's okay. You know, it's, it's the scars that you have to be proud of. And, um, and also my immune system has had its damage because yeah. of the medication, which is huge. They don't teach on this. Yeah. So today getting rid of a, a sickness takes mm -hmm. like twice as long yeah. because my body is trying to get back to the effects of being able to do what it needs to do. Um, so yeah, things started to get easier. I started to realize that I was gonna be the one to, to figure that out and not go backwards but forwards. And so let's see, it was around, uh, I'm trying to think, um, right around sophomore year, okay. I started to find my path, function appropriately. And I realized, you know what, I actually don't really want to take meds. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to try out not taking meds today. Okay. And um, I realized that I actually were, was forgetting to take it because right. I felt so much better without mm -hmm. it. So that's when I was like, well, you know, I, I went from not taking it one day, then I took it another time. And then, cause my parents made sure to like keep track. Yeah. And then I said, no, I actually just don't want to take it at all. So I would act like I took it when I didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were like, Amanda, oh my gosh, you didn't take your meds. And they were like, did you take it yesterday? And I said, no. Did you get the day before? No, it, I don't like the way it made me feel. It would make me sleep. Well, what about like last week? No. How long has it been, right? <laughs> so now we're talking like a few weeks and um, they they called my doctors and um, then the truth, when I was on the radio, I, I shared of this too. I never went back because I was so traumatized yeah. that I just was like, forget it. Yeah. So I in turn, just stopped the medication. And I went through some withdrawals mm -hmm. in my stomach, surprisingly, yeah. mm -hmm. um, which only lasted a few weeks and then um, got back to my balance as best I could. And that became the Amanda you see today. Yeah. So 2011, that was the, the peak of um, really shining and, and being able to do what I, what I do. And since that point, I never went back to where I used to be. And I went to college and I did online school too. And I gave talks and I realized, oh, wow, I have a story and people yeah. want to know more about it. They're like, we don't see you doing anything. How are you able to, to do what you do? And you went through that. And that's when I, I thought, wow, I guess, this isn't, this hasn't been done, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. this I, to go from a very insane, severe case and come out of it and not being on meds and working with it on my own. Oh, wow. Like that's pretty mind blowing. Yeah. And that's when I started to look into the community, the TSA, um, Tourette syndrome association mm -hmm. and, um, and going to camps and, um, and everything started to become the Amanda boss you see yeah. right now and wow. uh, the work that I'm doing to now it takes the effort. I always say you go through it severely, you go through the healing and the broken bones and having to figure that out. You do that for yourself. You get out of it your own way. And the fourth thing is you walk back down to reach these people to get them up here. You actually are walking back down to lift them up to get to where you are. And that takes freaking balls. Yeah. And it's not easy. So, you know, you may not see me doing anything, but Tourette's is still part of my life. Mm -hmm. The the thoughts are still there yeah. and they try. And so I'm doing even more work mm -hmm. to continue that balance and to continue to teach on and continue to help others while also having my own little child yeah. on my back all the yeah. time. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's where I realized that's my path. That's my journey. And that's where Mind Boss Academy 
is what it is today. It's really awesome. I, mean, I want to ask you as well, just, just before we close up, you know, how long were you at the, the psychiatric ward for? So this, I, I have to look back okay. on the, the days because um, it feels like such a blur, as yeah. you can imagine. Um, it was around the 25 to 35 okay. day mark. Right. They wanted to keep me longer, um, I'm assuming, obviously. Um, but I'm grateful it was only that because <laughs> I'm actually, when I smell certain lotions, yeah. it takes me back yeah. to that. It's the mental um, cause they use like certain like cucumber melon or something in the, you know, the, um, as a lotion there. Mm -hmm. And like, it's amazing. The mind is like, it knows. Oh yeah. And I can't use that anymore. And so I'm, I'm very grateful that, that I, you know, didn't have as much yeah. trauma from that yeah. when I could have. And, and it is, I mean, like I say, you know, it, it is incredible. And if I can encourage anybody, uh, you know, I encourage you with this because it's life lessons that I have uh, gone through, you know, in different ways. But um, sometimes we go through situations that absolutely suck. If we had the option, we would not want to go through them. But, you know, when you go through them, and as Amanda said, you know, so eloquently, you know, far better than I will, uh, you know, you go through it and you come out the other side and you may just find that doors open that you never ever thought possible obviously amanda's described on how her life has completely changed and she's going on to help so many people literally through this podcast as well as soon as this go live she's going to be exposed to the entire world and that is incredible and you guys have done that and made that happen amanda is there, is there anything that you want to touch on that we haven't touched on um in this episode oh, i'm just so grateful i am like uh it just, it really chokes me up like this morning when I woke up, I'm like, so just beyond blessed to be able to share this and, um, and, you know, thanking myself too, for changing that yeah. to be able to, to show others it can be done. Yeah. And I want to have a long list of people who have done this work yeah. Yeah. and to be a part of it because we're building a new new change in this yeah. world and spiritually, mentally, emotionally, right. It's, it goes so deep. And so I want to thank you again and, you know, thank everybody who listens and I hope you gain something and, and you can really transform your life and whatever things that you're facing and know that there is always a reason. Yeah. And when I think to to somebody even asking me, would you go through it again? I would. Mm -hmm. And am I grateful for that? And I am. And if I didn't have this whole experience, I wouldn't know who I am right now. Yeah. I, I feel that there was a beauty to my journey and, and creating what it, what it is right now. So the soul always knows. Absolutely. It knows. Absolutely. And, and obviously, I mean, you're going to go on to so much more great work. And I can't wait to see, you know, all the things that you do. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Amanda, two, two final questions. Um, you know, what are some of the symptoms for parents to be on the lookout for um, if they suspect that their child maybe have Tourette's? Honestly, trust your gut. You, yeah. it, regarding anything, obviously, um, Tourette's, not Tourette's, you know, you know your child better than anyone. I mean, when they're a child, they're still developing. So pay attention to the subtle signs um, and listen to them. Um, the first symptoms regarding Tourette's is definitely twitching um, and um, certain behavior patterns. Uh, it's, it's common for children to have, you know, rapid behaviors that come and go um, that don't really make sense. A lot of tantrums as children and the, the beginning stages of Tourette's is around five. It can be, yeah, five to seven years old. Wow. Um, a lot of motor movements yeah. look for things in the face, twitching, blinking, um, things that are just not common um, to see and uh, go from there mm -hmm. and, and see if there's anything that can be done. And, and diagnosis, diagnosis is important, but at the same time, 
just just listen, just really feel out the situation. And I always share with families when they're not aware whether medication is a great route, you know, every day children are being put on, on these things, Mm -hmm. but there's no approach of getting them off. And that's a problem. And that's somewhat where I come in, but not to say medication's bad. And like, if you really need it, like obviously do what you need to do. Like for my case, I, I needed something to get by, but if there's a way to maneuver it, then do so. Yep. You know, trust your intuition with that and your instincts and, and be that support mm-hmm. for them. That's really awesome. Final question. Where can folks go to get in touch with you if they want to follow you on social media and also if they want to find more out about Tourette's? Absolutely. So Tourette's, honestly, there's a lot of great stuff online depending on, <laughs> you know, the certain... <laughs> Obviously, we know cursing is a big part of it, Um, but yeah, there's things that you can look up regarding, you know, symptoms and uh, there's other forms of therapy that you can look into. CBIT's a big one. Um, To get a hold of me, I'm on Facebook, um, Amanda N. Bossy, um, and as well as Instagram is a huge one for me um, at Miss Brain Boss. And... um, and my website is currently being um, worked on um, again to update, but that is at um, mindbossacademy.com. So I'm so excited. And okay. it's really taking a, a huge, a huge role in the right direction, a like, huge step. It's a huge stepping stone. That is so, so exciting. And it's been an absolute delight and an honor uh you know doing this show with you and hopefully helping people out there and we want to encourage you if you've got questions you've got comments do get in touch because amanda and i pretty much talk you know at least once or twice a week you know we can get in touch with you reach out to her because you know don't ignore the things that are going on and don't just pretend they're going to go away if you have genuine concerns do get in touch and do reach out of course we want to invite you to come and follow us uh, at mind body and soul one-to-one on Instagram as well, the Mind, Body and Soul page on Facebook. And really exciting as well that my brand new book probably will be out by the time that this airs and it's called The Battles We All Face. We've got an ad that's coming up for that at the end of the show. But if you're struggling with anxiety, depression, just focusing on your time, concerns about this, concerns about that, and just looking for something there to really help you and to really let you know that you're not alone through these things, This book is definitely for for you already. We've sold out of our pre-order stock, which is incredible. Um, That went within the first two days. We've had to order more. Really, really excited about this as well. And plus, plus, not only that, but you're going to get to see exclusively some of my brand new artwork that has been done especially for this book as well. Um, And that is something many people don't know. I'm actually an internationally renowned artist and I've been doing it for 18 years, but now we're in mind, body and soul. We're doing other things as well. So I'm a juggler. So you can come and visit us at thebattlesweallface.com. Watch uh, at the end of the show for the ad. You will absolutely love it. But for today, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Tell a friend because two things. It may just be the very thing that they need to hear at the time. But not only that, it helps our little channel grow as well. And we can reach more people doing more amazing stuff. I'm sure we're going to have Amanda back on at some point because there's so much more to unpack. But again, from myself, from Amanda Bossy, I have been your host, John Morris. This has been the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, helping you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life through motivational, inspirational, and educational content. We have an amazing day. Take care. God bless.